Before we dive into k-means, it's important to first understand what clusters actually are. Clusters are simply groups of data points that share similar attributes. For example, in this dataset, we can clearly see three distinct groups of points that are more similar to each other within the group than to points in the other groups. So, we say that there are three clusters here. And that's essentially what a cluster means. A collection of data points that are more alike to each other than to the rest. Now let's see how the k-means algorithm actually works. Suppose we have this data set of points. And our goal is to find clusters within it. First, we place two random centroids, assuming we want to form two clusters here. We will discuss later in the video how to decide the number of clusters and different ways to initialize centroids. But for now, let's continue. The next step is to calculate the distance between each data point and the two centroids and then assign each point to whichever centroid it is closest to. For example, if a point is closer to the red centroid, we assign it to the red cluster. And if it's closer to the blue centroid, we assign it to the blue cluster. Once all points are assigned, the centroids are then moved to the average position of the points in their cluster. This process of assignment and updating continues, iteration after iteration, until the centroids no longer move significantly. At that point, the algorithm stops and we are left with the final clusters. Now let's formulate k-means mathematically. Suppose we have a data set x in a general d-dimensional space and we initialize k-centroids, meaning we want to form k-clusters. We will discuss later how to choose the value of k, but for now, assume it is given. Think of both the data points and the centroids as vectors in d-dimensional space. The first step is the assignment step. For each data point, we calculate its distance to every centroid. Instead of just taking the raw distance, we actually square it. This is done purely for mathematical convenience, since squaring does not change which centroid is the closest. But it makes the math simpler to work with. After computing the squared distances to all k centroids, we pick the smallest one and assign that data point to the corresponding cluster. This assignment is represented using ci, which indicates the cluster to which the ith data point belongs to. And once the points are assigned to the cluster, the next step is to update the centroids. For each cluster, we take all the data points assigned to it and compute their mean position. That average becomes the new centroid for the next iteration. What we are actually doing in k-means is minimizing a cost function, usually denoted as j. This function measures how far each data point is from its assigned centroid. Mathematically, it is written with a double summation. The inner summation represents the assignment of data points to a particular cluster. The outer summation means we are doing this for all k clusters. This function is called within cluster sum of squares. In simple terms, the algorithm is trying to move the centroids in such a way that this cost always decreases with every iteration of k-means and it will never increase. Now the question is, how do we decide how many clusters we actually need? For example, if we set k equals 2, the data splits in two clusters. If we set k equals 3, it splits further. And for higher values of k, the clusters keep getting divided into smaller groups. One of the most widely used approaches to find the good value of k is the elbow method. In this method, we run k-means for multiple values of k. And for each case, we calculate the cost function j. Then we plot the value of k against the cost. Now, we don't simply pick the k where the cost is the smallest, because the cost always decreases as k increases. Instead, we look for the elbow point, the point on the graph after which the cost is no longer reduced significantly, and the improvement becomes marginal. In this example, k equals 3 looks like a good choice, although k equals 4 here is also acceptable. Now, we should not rely only on these mathematical methods to decide the optimal values for k. The choice of clusters also depends on the actual application. For example, suppose our dataset has GDP and population as features, 
and we want to group different types of places. If we choose k equals 3, the clusters might represent small, medium and large cities. But if we set k equals 5, the grouping could be more detailed, like rural areas, small, medium, large and mega cities. Both are valid interpretation depending on the purpose of the analysis. So while methods like the elbow method are useful, we should also use common sense and domain knowledge when deciding on the number of clusters. Now in the animation at the start of this video, I randomly place the centroids anywhere on the screen. But in practice, we rarely do that. Instead, a common approach is to randomly select k data points directly from the dataset and use those as the initial centroids. This way, the centroids start at positions that already lie within the data distribution, which usually leads to faster convergence and more meaningful clusters compared to placing them completely at random. Let's see this in action. We will take the same GDP versus population dataset from earlier, and this time, suppose we want three clusters. So we initialize three centroids by choosing three points from the dataset. Once that's done, the k-means algorithm starts running as usual. In each iteration, data points are assigned to the nearest centroid, the centroids move to the average position, and the process repeats until the centroids settle into their optimal positions. And this is not just an animation. The k-means is actually running in the background on the dataset. You can try it out yourself. I have added the code in the description below. Now, one problem with this is that if we initialize the centroids randomly, the clusters can come out differently on different runs. Like here, with the same dataset, if the algorithm starts with a different random initialization of centroids, in the end, we get slightly different clusters. So when this happens, a good way to pick the best one is to calculate the cost function we discussed earlier for each result and then choose the clustering with the minimum cost. This way, the best clustering is selected. Here, I have just shown it with four random initializations. But in real world applications, k-means is often run with hundreds of different initializations to make sure we get a stable result. And that's pretty much all about k-means. See you in the next video.